Welcome everybody to the Parkinson's Foundation Introduction to Lewy Body Dementia. Uh, I am uh, Yasar Torres Yagi. Um, I'm an attending physician in movement disorders, but I was also trained in memory disorders during my fellowship. So I'm a hybrid uh, subspecialist. I take care of patients with Parkinsonism and dementia. In addition to Parkinson's disease, um, I also take care of patients with Lewy body disease. Uh, understanding Lewy body disease is so important, um, and it's, it's so much a part of a passion of mine when I talk about uh, all of the different conditions that we might experience. It's very important to understand the severity and the degree of cognitive change that might occur in both par Parkinson's disease and Lewy body disease. Whenever you think about cognitive impairment, right? If someone has an experience of memory change or they meet, they're seeking help and trying to get a diagnosis, we always have to think about the difference between mild changes that might be due to aging or mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And so we can help tease that out if we, if we uh, put on the right uh, investigator hat of understanding whether or not a patient has any cognitive impairment. We do things like Montreal cognitive assessments, asking patients to remember things, words, write down um, what, uh, like a sentence about um, anything they want, understand if they can calculate things, spell words or spell words backwards. There's all these sorts of uh, standardized scales that we use to try and understand whether or not a patient has age-related memory change, or if they actually have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, which would be more changes than expected for aging. And then when we think about dementia, we have to remember the difference between mild cognitive impairment and dementia really is that impact or that negative impact on our functional abilities to do things like taking care of ourselves and those activities of daily living. So let's always remember that dementia itself is an umbrella term and it's used to describe a range of symptoms of cognitive impairment. It's important for the Parkinson's Foundation um, to be able to continue to educate about this because we do see that in Parkinson's disease, cognitive impairment can be something that becomes more and more pronounced as the condition progresses in certain people. So let's look about 1.4 million uh, people from the United States might have a diagnosis of dementia. Uh, maybe 50 to 75% might have that diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, 20 to 30% vascular uh, dementia, about 10 to 25% Lewy body disease, and 10 to 15% frontotemporal lobe dementia. Um, and so these are different diagnoses, but remember, there, it's not uncommon for there to be mixed pathologies when we talk about dementia. So there could be mixed diagnoses. And so sometimes we see mixed symptoms. And Lewy body disease, generally speaking, is essentially, as, we, as we've talked about, this combination between cognitive change, Parkinsonian motor features, fluctuating cognition. So sometimes hours can be better than others in terms of cognitive capacity. Sometimes days can be better than others, um, um, along with other symptoms. So here you can see, when we talk about the naming of what it is that we're talking about, Lewy body disease, Lewy body dementia, is it dementia with Lewy bodies? Is it diffuse Lewy body disease? What is it? Is it DLB or LBD? Parkinson's disease is, um, is, um, is, is something that we can diagnose, but if we're neglecting to really understand the cognitive impact of our alpha-synuclein uh, protein um, disorder, then we might be missing you know, a very important component of the overall diagnosis. And so, so what is a Lewy body? right? A Lewy body is a, you heard me say alpha-synuclein, Lewy bodies are seen in both Parkinson's disease and in Lewy body disease. And you see that it's basically a buildup of alpha-synuclein and these inclusion bodies within the neurons that build up and build up and build up because as we age and because of the disease and the condition, we lose that ability to kind of remove some of that accumulation of that protein and it develops into these Lewy bodies. So, we have to think about Lewy body disease as the pathology that we see within the neurons, right? So we see Lewy bodies within the neurons. And underneath that, that understanding, we see a potential diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. And then 
when we look underneath Lewy body dementia, we have to think about Parkinson's disease dementia versus dementia with Lewy bodies. In Parkinson's disease with dementia, oftentimes a patient will have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and they'll have motor symptoms that over time, many, many years, can develop into some cognitive aspects to the condition. In dementia with Lewy bodies or Lewy body disease, we might see that cognitive aspect be more pronounced early on in the condition. Or sometimes that cognitive aspect can precede the movement disorder. And so whenever we see that, we always have to be attuned to understanding Lewy body disease um, and seeing if that might be the diagnosis. There is this understanding of a one-year rule. And so when you talk about Parkinson's disease with dementia, oftentimes we have that development of dementia already in a well-established Parkinson's disease diagnosis. And usually it'll happen, you'll start seeing that dementia one year or more after that diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. With dementia with Lewy bodies, just to reinforce a, an important chron chronological aspect to the, to the discussion, is you might have dementia at the same time or prior to those Parkinsonian motor features like tremor, rigidity, slowness of movement, or impaired gait. So when we think about diagnosing Lewy body dementia, it's important to understand that Parkinson's disease with dementia is also something that we're looking for. If you can do at least yearly cognitive evaluations, we can start monitoring our patients and make sure that they're not developing cognitive impairment. About 80% of people with Parkinson's disease will develop dementia in their lifetime. So we know that the risk is about four to six times higher in those without Parkinson's disease than those without Parkinson's disease. So it makes sense to not neglect the cognitive aspect to everything. Lewy body disease is an under-recognized and under-diagnosed condition. So we can look at, our, at a case and sometimes when we think about that diagnostic journey I always talk about, it can take about 18 months and three doctors to receive that right diagnosis. DLB is the most misdiagnosed form of dementia and it's probably the most expensive form of dementia because I would argue because of the neurobehavioral aspects to the condition. And so let's look at what those, those different components are to understand Lewy body disease in more depth. And so we must see that there's a cognitive decline plus two, two of the following features. You see Parkinsonism with slowness, stiffness, and shakiness, of course. Well, a lot of the times we understand those symptoms in this ecosystem very well, right? We think about bradykinesia, slowness, stiffness, shakiness. But remember, you don't always have to have shakiness to diagnose Parkinson's disease or Lewy body disease. What you might need is just a little bit of bradykinesia and stiffness or rigidity. And so those can be very subtle features. And that's why it can be very hard if a patient's also experiencing cognitive change and those fluctuations of level of alertness or zoning out episodes. It's not uncommon for our patients to have these zoning out episodes and have our, our, our ears and our eyes alerted to potential TIA, right? A patient might feel like they're almost even having a TIA when in fact they're having these changes in level of alertness or arousal or zoning out. So cognitive fluctuations is a key component to diagnosing Lewy body disease. What about visual hallucinations? We can have different forms of visual hallucinations. We can have presence hallucinations where you feel the presence of a person. You might not see them, but you feel them. You can have what's called a passing hallucination where a per, uh, so an animal or a person's passing or a shadow might pass your near periphery. REM behavioral sleep disorder and acting out of dreams are very important. They've, they very much help us support that diagnosis of Lewy body disease. They can occur decades before other symptoms. So all of these symptoms need to be screened for and detected in order to really make that accurate diagnosis. And you can see on average how long it takes to make that accurate diagnosis and how many, how many doctors or healthcare practitioners our patients might see before we finally get that answer. Sometimes you really have to look at that historical context and really tease things out to make that diagnosis. So if there's only one core clinical feature, then additional testing can be ordered. So if you look back at those core uh, cardinal features of Lewy body disease, we use what are called biomarkers to help us, right? A DAT scan is a dopamine active transporter scan and can let us know if we're dealing with a dopamine deficiency. That's a nuclear medicine or an imaging biomarker, right? It's very, very helpful in detecting a dopamine deficiency. Sleep study can be done. 
Sleep studies are very helpful in detecting all sorts of sleep conditions that everyone might have, but also patients with Lewy body disease might have. REM behavioral sleep disorder, periodic lip movements of sleep. We can see restless leg syndrome as part of our Parkinsonian um, overall um, um, uh, components of symptoms. And then an MIBG scan is a scan that looks at the innervation of the heart. We know that autonomic dysfunction and that denervation or that lack of nervous system excitation of the heart um, can be seen in patients that have a Parkinsonism. So that's something also that can be done. And they can all be done. And we, we're trying to see if whether or not we see any abnormalities in any of these studies. They can help raise that diagnostic um, confirmation, confirmatory diagnostic tests are all done in, in tandem sometimes, it's a very dynamic process. So things to keep in mind today, PDD and DLB are likely on a spectrum, right? Under the umbrella of Lewy body dementia rather than two separate conditions. The signs and symptoms cannot separate Parkinson's disease from dementia with Lewy bodies. Timing and chronology can. Remember, the way the symptoms develop, screening for all of those symptoms, understanding when they started, whether or not cognitive change occurred before or after Parkinsonian motor symptoms, how long the Parkinsonian motor symptoms were there before the development of cognitive impairment, um, and taking into account those cardinal features are very, very important. Understanding what came first, right? It's kind of the chicken or the egg question, movement trouble or cognitive trouble. I think that's a nice general way of thinking about it. Recognition and correct diagnosis are the first steps. We need to be able to do a better job of detecting. We talked about how Lewy body disease might be an underdetected diagnosis because you can see how complex, how nuanced, and how many features are very important in understanding before we come up with that right diagnosis. So I wanted to thank you all for listening to me. I think this is an important topic. I, I'm so happy to be able to talk about it. In 2021, there's so much that can be done. There's a lot of research. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of momentum. And I want everyone to feel that hope and that positivity after this presentation. Um, please enjoy the film and thank you very much. Thank you for watching Spark with us. Now we'd like to start our panel discussion. I'm joined by Abigail Tidwell, clinical social worker for the Movement Disorder Programs at Georgetown University. And Dr. Yagi, also at Georgetown University Hospital, a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence and Lewy Body Dementia Research Center of Excellence. And we're also joined by Turk and Barbara Despar to share their experience. So first I'd like to start with a question for Dr. Yagi. You touched on the difference between Lewy Body Dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease dementia. There seems to be a lot of overlap. What are the clues that you rely on in clinic to help make a diagnosis? And are there any early signs or symptoms? Thanks for asking. It's a, a very important question. Whenever we're trying to determine what sort of solutions um, to be able to provide as a clinician to the problems that we can detect, I think the diagnosis is key. And so because of what you mentioned about the overlap between all of those different uh, diagnoses, we have what's called a differential diagnosis in our mind at all times as clinicians. So we always think about the different types of cognitive impairment that a patient might suffer from, and then whether or not a patient's suffering from the motor symptoms that we know so well in Parkinson's disease. When we start seeing an overlap in terms of cognitive change or dysfunction, Parkinsonian motor features, whether it be tremor, rigidity, stiffness, slowness of movement, bradykinesia, gait impairment. Those are kind of the motor symptoms that we think about. But how do we dis distinguish between the different diagnoses? It's really dependent on the prevalence and the intensity of all these different symptoms. So whenever we see a patient that might have cognitive change in the setting of Parkinsonian motor features, we always do need to think about um, Lewy body disease as something that could be on our differential diagnosis. We also do a good job of screening for the non-motor symptoms. The non-motor symptoms are the anosmia, which means um, uh, difficulty with sense of smell, constipation, depression and anxiety. We can have REM behavioral sleep disorder, our inability to stay um, immobile during REM sleep while we're dreaming. And 
The other, the other factors that we look for are hallucinations and delusions. And so whenever we put it all together, we have to take into account all of those symptoms before we can really accurately make the, the right diagnosis. And oftentimes, it's hard to make that final determination because it's very much dependent on the history and the chronology of these symptoms. And so oftentimes, we have to kind of consider the fact that Parkinson's disease with cognitive impairment and Parkinson's disease with psychosis and Lewy body disease in and of itself can look exactly the same when you really look at the pathology in the brain. But it's that chronology of symptoms and how the symptoms develop that really distinguish between the different, the different diagnoses. Okay, that's a nice intro for Turk and Barbara to share their experience and describe some of your earliest symptoms that you were seeing and how they have changed over time. Uh, I first uh, noticed that I had all kinds of problems, physical problems. My eyelids didn't completely shut. My eyes dried out. My voice got raspy. I had tremors. My slight left hand, when I was, was quiet, moved. I drooled a lot. My unstable posture. I had some violent dreams. I had 10 or a dozen of them. Uh, my family kept track of those because they heard of them all like that. Urination problems. I had slight confidence. I had uh, constipation ever since then. And my voice got very raspy. So I was very quiet about these symptoms and I didn't go out too much and I was kept, I kept myself lonely. I mean, the, the symptoms were very slight at that point and Turk did a very good job of hiding them. Okay, so it wasn't until we had a, uh, an incident of a TIA that we really started on a road toward diagnosis. So Abigail, if you are, you know, just meeting families for the first time or they're connecting with Dr. Yagi, what resources are available for families or spouses or people living with Lewy body dementia or other dementias? For example, um, encouraging families to reach out to learn more, find support groups. Yeah, there are many resources these days. There are national resources like the LBDA, uh, they're a great place to start to get information about uh, educational information about the diagnosis and also what other resources are available nationally. And then there are a lot of local organizations and local resources. And so as a social worker, I recommend seeing if your clinic has a social worker because they're going to be the real expert in what is available for you and your family and your loved ones uh, in navigating through this diagnosis and, and just anything that might come up. Um, back to Turk and Barbara, we left off with you sharing the experience of having the TIA as that incident that helped open the box of what Turk was experiencing. Can you share a little more about your journey into diagnosis and any resources that you found? And Turk was at his computer and um, all of a sudden was um, uh, talking to me and all of a sudden his speech got very slurred and, um, oh, yeah. and he couldn't uh, pronounce words and uh, he couldn't stand, he couldn't move. And we're here, we're living now in Lewis, Delaware. Uh, and um, so we went, uh, we looked quickly on the, on the computer and we thought he was having a TIA, a stroke. So we went immediately to the ER. Uh, from there, um, uh, we were sent to a neurologist. Um, and that was about back in 215. We didn't feel comfortable with the diagnosis. Uh, it just didn't seem to fit. <laughs> and uh, Turk was having more of these episodes where he was sort of freezing because the disease has progressed. And uh, I must say this different stages <laughs> have been uh, a little bit disconcerting. And I could talk about that maybe a little bit later, but Dr. Yagi has been marvelous the whole way through, not only treating Turk, 
but um, just one, you know, making sure I was okay. Um, I want to turn to Dr. Yagi and talk a little more about hallucinations, delusions, and sleep disruptions, and how these symptoms might present in someone with Lewy body dementia. So understanding hallucinations in depth is, is very important. So in, in asking both the patient and the caregiver the same question can be very, very helpful because oftentimes you might hear differing answers, you know? So you might ask a question, an open-ended question like, do you have hallucinations or do you ever see people or animals that might not be there? It's not uncommon for patients to nod their head and say, you know what? Yes, I've, I've experienced those for a while. And it's also not uncommon for a partner to say, at the same time, be shaking their head no. Mm -hmm. And the patient may not have said anything until we ask the question. And the partner might say, wait, hold on a second. How come you didn't tell me? And it's, it's something that we try our best to detect because it doesn't always come out unless you ask and you try to understand it better. Also delusions, the feelings of distrust or suspiciousness, or sometimes a misidentification of a loved one as a stranger, or misidentification of one's own home as another home um, mm -hmm. can, can be uh, sometimes this fixed idea um, or delusions um, that also play a role in the entirety of the neurobehavioral aspects of the condition. And then you ask about the acting out of our dreams. The REM behavioral sleep disorder um, is one of the components to understanding the overall nature of Lewy body disease and Parkinsonism in general. And so we do have to do a good job of not just detecting hallucinations and delusions, but also understanding the degree of REM behavioral sleep disorder. Because when you put it all together in the setting of cognitive dysfunction, <laughs> You may not necessarily have one only, but you might have this combination of symptoms that lead us down to diagnosis of Lewy body disease or a Parkinsonian uh, syndrome. It's very, un very important to well, understand. So um, thinking about some of the things that Barbara shared um, about the journey and uh, has the stages changed, do you have suggestions or recommendations how people can find support or how to interact with people who are having these changes in their symptoms. For example, the, the hallucinations and delusions that Dr. Yagi was speaking about and how to help them and, or how to respond to them. Yeah, so I think that it's important to, to figure out if the person who's experiencing the hallucinations and the delusions, if they have insight into what's going on because some people might realize that what they're seeing isn't there or, or what they're thinking doesn't really make sense, but they're still thinking it. Um, and then other people might not realize it as much. And so you want to handle a person with, with some insight versus without as much insight uh, a little bit differently. So if someone is aware of, of their hallucinations or delusions, then it, it, I would recommend just starting out by asking that person what what would be helpful to them whenever they are experiencing these things? Uh, you know, what what comforts them, what distracts them, and and what how you can best support them. And so that that can kind of you know clear up what what you can do as a support uh, and make things a little bit easier. Uh, and then also just being there for them in the moment, and then taking you know taking them on a walk or, or, you know, going, getting a change of scenery, doing those kinds of things can, can help. Uh, and similarly, you can do that with someone who has not as much insight. I still, you know, think that, that a change of scenery, an activity, uh, anything that can provide some kind of distraction could be helpful. And also with someone who doesn't have as much insight, really nailing down where they feel most comfortable and most safe, who they feel safest with, who they trust, and figuring that out so you can use those things to your advantage to, to help that person feel more comfortable. And then for, for caregivers and care partners and families, I think that support groups are a great place to go to get 
you know, support, of course, but also to get ideas about what's worked for other families and, and just to have that collective conversation about what you're going through can be, you know, very helpful. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so wrap up our panel discussion, I'd like to bring it back to Turk and Barbara for mm -hmm. your thoughts about what you'd want others to know other caregivers or people living with Lewy body dementia or Parkinsonian, what are some things or some silver linings that you've seen through your journey or helpful tips for others? You need, you need somebody that can help, help you be honest with you. Yeah. And I it's think hard to find. Dr. Yagi was very helpful with that. Dr. Yagi was fantastic. Right, right. So, and you also had your Parkinson's crew Turk went to a wonderful right. Rise Gym program that did the big movements. And uh, <laughs> according to Dr. Yagi, one of the very, very best things you can do with Parkinson's is exercise. But um, and, joining a caregiver's group was the very, very best thing I could have done because I could see um, I'm very good if I take something to the very worst and then work back and see, you know, how I'm going to handle that. Uh, so that gave me a lot of helpful information, as well as where we were headed uh, along the lines of um, the social worker, as far as what's available in our immediate area. area. And we have a hospice program that's palliative care and has been unbelievably wonderful uh, because there are different stages that Turk goes through that I think were perfectly adjusted. And then another stage of his Parkinson's all of a sudden occurs. And I think, oh, wow, where are we? And Well, thank you guys so much for your time today and sharing your personal experience, Turk and Barbara. I really appreciate that. Hello and welcome to a little live Q&A with Dr. Yagi and Abby taking questions from our live audience today. Hello. Hi. All right. Hi, we've got about 15 minutes and a lot of questions. So we're going to do some rapid fire. Sound good? Yeah, we're ready. Okay. Dr. Yagi, are Lewy bodies and alpha synuclein visible? And could they be detected on brain scans? Could they be touched, dissolved? And is there a diagnostic test that could show that you have Lewy body dementia? Great question. You know, the name Lewy body came from the person who first described them. Um, and the way they're detected is by actually looking um, at our neurons post-mortem. So in a person that has had um, a condition and then after passing away, we can look at the brain um, under a microscope. And that's how we can detect these Lewy bodies. And so a lot of the times um, having that um, ability to detect the disorders very much uh, based on your clinical um, um, outcomes and your clinical suspicion based on your examination, um, on your, uh, under, uh, your ability to understand the chronolo chronological order of, of things in terms of when Parkinsonian motor symptoms started, when we started experiencing cognitive impairment, if there were hallucinations, delusions as part of the overall clinical picture. But we do use biomarkers and the biomarkers that we use are called neuroimaging biomarkers. And so because we can't look under the microscope and detect these Lewy bodies, the Lewy bodies themselves are alpha synuclein clumps, essentially, a protein that we see within the neurons that we see in Parkinson's disease, in Parkinson's disease with dementia, and in Lewy body dementia. But because we can't look under the microscope um, in, a, in our patients, we use those neuroimaging biomarkers. And so it's a great question. How is it that we come up with that accurate diagnosis? A lot of the times it takes multiple types of biomarkers. We have our clinical exam, which is a biomarker in and of itself. And then we have these nuclear medicine biomarkers where we actually can determine whether or not there is a dopamine deficiency. It's the same type of scan that we use for Parkinson's disease. 
So if we can determine that there's a deficiency in dopamine on the nuclear medicine scan, essentially what we do is we send our patients to get a DAT scan. That's a dopamine active transporter scan. And what it does is it shows us the amount of receptors that there are in the basal ganglia that kind of help transport the dopamine into that part of the brain called the striatum. If we see that there's a deficiency or a reduction of uptake in that part of the brain, that helps us determine that we most likely have a deficiency in dopamine. Now that could be either Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease with dementia or Lewy body disease, but it helps narrow down all the different diagnoses underneath that umbrella of a dopamine deficiency. So yes, there are ways. Okay, so we have the umbrella term dementia like you mentioned in the previous presentation. Are there different treatment options or different medications based on those different dementias or is there an overall approach? You got it. And so it's such a, an important question to give us hope and positivity. Hope and positivity are so important. You heard um, from uh, Robin Williams, you heard his story um, and uh, you heard it kind of um, from the perspective of family, friends, partner, and hearing that story is so inspiring to continue to find different therapeutics to be able to tackle the cognitive impairment that we run into in both Parkinson's disease and in Lewy body disease, Lewy body dementia. And so what we, what we tend to do is use medications to improve and augment cognitive ability. And we know which ones those are. And they've been studied in dementia. Um, there have been certain uh, medications that have been studied for Parkinson's disease um, with cognitive impairment and dementia, and then with Lewy body disease. And so we have medications such as the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that have been well studied. Um, those are donepezil, rivastigmine, galantamine. And we have another family of medicine called nonantine, which can be helpful um, in, in, in um, treating cognitive change or cognitive impairment in dementia called nonantine. And so we might use those medications in combination with each other, combining the families of medications um, to help improve cognitive abilities, memory. Remember, cognition is memory, it's attention, it's executive function. There are these different aspects to cognition. So hope, hoping that with these therapies, we're able to augment those different components. Um, and there are ways that we can try and treat any hallucinations or delusions if they're present. The other aspect to this is the REM behavioral sleep disorder, acting out of one's dreams. There are therapeutic options for that as well. And if we also tie in the psychiatric component, depression, anxiety, we use medications that are used for psychiatry to treat those symptoms as well. And so you can imagine the different kind of globally, the different medications that we have as part of our overall regimen, how we fight back. Great, thank you. So Abby, this question is for you. Talking about all the symptoms that Dr. Yagi says, what if you have a loved one you suspect may have Parkinson's or dementia or LBD, has the, all those symptoms, how do you encourage them and get them to the doctor to get checked on this? That's a great question. I think that the first thing, you know, is just trying to be honest with that person and, and letting them know that you're concerned, you've noticed these things, and you just want to try to figure out if there's anything that can be done to help enhance their quality of life and get, you know, get this kind of figured out and see, see how that goes. I think being honest in all, you know, stages of, of this disease is really important. It's not always the easiest, but it, it's a great place to start to, to have that conversation. Great, thanks. Dr. Yagi, is Lewy body dementia genetically linked? Is it hereditary? What are the chances of a family member getting the disease if a parent had it? Another important question, you know, I always say that <clears throat> anything in its essence is genetic, right? You know, it just depends on whether or not any genetic changes are inheritable um, and that we see might, in, that we might see in different generations of families or in siblings. Um, and so the way we think about it is there's different causes um, of neurodegenerative conditions. And there are certain conditions where we might see based on when we see these symptoms, um, for example, earlier on, if someone is younger, 
in Parkinson's disease. There might be a genetic link that might be more likely inheritable from generation to generation if we see a younger onset Parkinson's patient. The later we are when we are diagnosed, then the less likely it is that this is a, an inheritable genetic type of Parkinson's and more likely that it's due to what's called idiopathic causes. We don't know, essentially. Something that happens to our genetic profile or genetic makeup just from living and aging um, or certain exposures that we might not necessarily completely be aware of um, as a society. Same goes for Lewy body disease. You know, we have um, most of the cases with Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia are what are called idiopathic causes. So not necessarily inheritable um, genetic changes. And so most of the time when patients talk to me about their family members, et cetera, I say right now, we need to do a better job of understanding Lewy body dementia um, and being able to understand it scientifically and from a genetic uh, lens. And once we're able to do that, I think then we'll have a better understanding of the genetic causes and whether or not there is a high rate of inheritability. That said, most of the time in patients that are diagnosed, the reason is or the cause is not an inheritable genetic cause, but in fact, it's a, an idiopathic cause. Something happens to our body as we get older that leads to this buildup of protein and the buildup of protein that converts into Lewy bodies, those little inclusion bodies that overwhelm the neuron. If we see that inclusion or that accumulation of protein, that alpha-synuclein or Lewy bodies in the cortex, the part of the brain diffusely that affects our cognition, then that's when we tend to think about Lewy body disease. And that's how we think about it. Where in the brain we're seeing this accumulation of protein. Okay. Um, a lot of questions coming in about when a person with Parkinson's starts having cognitive issues, could it be dementia? Could it be linked to medication um, dosage? And also thinking about what what age or young onset like robin williams was 63 when he passed away with um you know lbd so just wanting to know more information about the the kind of progression and what how it can be seen in other people yeah great question as well uh, a lot of great questions like you said aaron and and so and this is a topic i'm so glad we're doing this um you know getting um, the word out, educating, trying to empower ourselves with more and more knowledge. So thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I really believe, you know, the first step is detection. And you always need to make sure you're screening and detecting. You need to make sure you understand the cognitive profile of every patient. Um, you have to understand that, you're, that, that whether or not you're dealing with delusions, hallucinations, depression, anxiety. These are the non-motor aspects that we see within a memory and movement disorder center. In certain centers, in our center, um, we have a hybrid approach to our evaluation. You know, we evaluate memory disorders cases, patients that have perhaps some cognitive change. We evaluate them with a movement disorders and memory disorders lens, both, so that we can come up with the accurate diagnosis and we screen for all of those aspects that I just mentioned. That helps us determine whether or not a medication might be predisposing our patient to hallucinations or delusions. Because it's true, a lot of the medications that we use, those dopaminergic agents in Parkinson's disease, our patients might have a low threshold to have hallucinations or delusions. And so a lot of the times it's dependent on whether or not a patient will manifest those symptoms is dependent on their threshold. And to determine the threshold and whether or not there's a low threshold, understanding whether or not cognitive impairment exists, or if there's already some underlying hallucinations or delusions is important. Remember earlier on, we talked about how if you don't ask a lot of the time, sometimes patients won't know to speak and won't know to tell. And so, because that kind of distinction between patient and caregiver and their answers to some of my screening questions, it's not uncommon for them, for them to have different answers. And so it's true that our medicines can lower that threshold or help have us create hallucinations or delusions or enhance them if they're already there in a patient with Parkinson's disease with psychosis. Um, but Lewy body disease is a little different. And Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia 
is essentially think about cognitive change, Parkinsonian motor features, and or hallucinations and delusions all around that same time period. So for Robin Williams' case, that is one case um, of a patient who unfortunately had psychiatric manifestations of, of um, depression in the setting of psychosis and delusions and cognitive change and Parkinsonism. In patients with Parkinson's disease that later on develop psychosis, what happens is early on in their diagnosis, they might have motor symptoms or some non-motor symptoms, but they don't necessarily develop cognitive impairment or dementia until many, many years after the diagnosis of Parkinsonian motor features. But we do track and monitor patients over time to make sure that we are staying ahead of, you know, staying ahead of it rather than playing catch up, understanding when our patients have cognitive impairment. Monitoring our patients on a yearly or bi-yearly basis for cognitive change is one of the aspects of providing that care so that we can make sure that we detect cognitive change when it appears and or we detect hallucinations or delusions when they're there or when they start becoming an issue, even if they're underlying. Of course, there's, there's very variable degrees of, of hallucinations and delusions. And so all of that is part of our um, approach to the more comprehensive care for Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease, and Parkinson's disease with dementia, and Parkinson's disease with psychosis. All right, thank you for that explanation. We have time for one last question, and this is for Abby. What if you're a person with Parkinson's or LBD, and you are wanting to advocate for yourself, but you don't have someone like Susan Williams? What would be your advice for that person? I think that first starting to talk with your clinic to see who is there that can help support you on that journey. Cause I think advocacy is super important and, and standing up for yourself and for others. And so seeing if there's a social worker or if your neurologist knows of other people in the area that maybe have started a support group, or maybe there are other patients or individuals who, who want to connect over this and just kind of see what your clinic has to offer as far as, as resources to help you become a better advocate for yourself and to advocate for other people. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Yagi and Abby for your time today as that concludes our program. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us live for Spark. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the Lewy Body Dementia Association for their partnership on this program. And thank you to our sponsor, Acadia. Uh, we had a lot of questions come in. If you are not able to get your question answered, we'd love for you to call our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO. That's 1-800-473-4636. Or also the Lewy Body Dementia Association helpline at 1-800-539-9767. Or visit their website, lbda.org. Also want to let you know that there is another upcoming partnership with LSVT Big that will be hosting this webinar in October. So you can see that in the chat and we will also include that in our follow-up email that will be coming out. So thank you again for everyone for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.